There is only one thing on this earth more powerful than evil, and that's us. Hello, boys and girls. This is Spike. You're listening to Buffy Back Issue, Ben. Don't turn it off or I'll rip your throat out. Welcome to the Buffy Back Issue Bin, the show we go through all the Buffy and Firefly comics. I'm Zach. And I'm Emily. And today, we it is a special show. If you've listened to us at all, there is one man's name who has come up the most, the man who has done the most with all of the Buffy and Angel comics. Current writer of Superior Spider-Man, the wildly successful Spider-Man PlayStation 4 game that just came out. Co-writer on Amazing Spider-Man, Ninjack, Hawaii Five-0. Apparently one of the busiest writers <laughs> out there. But we are joined by Christo Gage. Hello. Thanks for talking to us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. You do really have, like, when I was going, just thinking of things you're currently working on, you have a crazy resume right now. Well, you know, I figure I need to uh, put food on the table, and as long as people want to work with me, you know, there was plenty of years when nobody wanted to work with me, so now that people do, I figure I'll do it. Yeah, well, we're very grateful that you did everything for the Buffy stuff that you did, and we're just so excited. Yeah. Cool. One of the things we figured out when we um, did our interview with George's Genty is that you have uh, the second most credits for as far as any Buffy story out there. If you count them all up behind Joss, you're number two. Really? More than more than George's, I guess? Yeah, by a couple. You beat him. Uh, <laughs> I'll have to rub that in next time I see him. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess first and foremost, uh, before you kind of got into the whole writing, what was your history with these shows? <laughs> well... It's it's uh, a bit different than a lot of fans. Uh, I had never seen a Buffy related show until uh, I was approached uh, by Scott Alley, the editor at Dark Horse, about writing the Angel show. So this was after both shows had ended. So I was like, well, I like Joss's work on Astonishing X Men. Uh, so I think I would probably like this, and I just hadn't gotten around to watching it ever. So I, I kind of binge watched the like I got all the DVDs, and I watched I think the first year two or three seasons of Buffy. Then I watched all of Angel, and then I finished off Buffy, and I, of course I loved it all. And my wife and I watched Firefly as well. But you know, it was funny because I had actually met Josh on the train back from San Diego. I think it was in 2007, and I was talking to him, and I was like, you know, I don't know any of your shows, but I really like your Astonishing X Men. So you know, we, yeah, we had a lot of the same influences. So we, we talked about comics. Yeah, because you got to play in that world a little bit with the uh, World War Hulk crossover. Oh yeah, I've got to write a lot of uh, a lot of fun stuff. Um, World War Hulk was probably definitely one of my like, you know, my childhood dream come true type of gigs because uh, the editor Randy Schmidt called me up and he's like, "Hey, we want to do a World War Hulk crossover with the X Men," and I was like, "Well, what do you want to? You know, is there anything you have in mind?" He was like, "Nope. What do you want to do?" And I said, "Well, can I just have the Hulk fighting the X Men like all the X Men for like all three <laughs> issues?" And he was like, "Yeah, okay, sure." <laughs> Um, and, <laughs> and for those who don't know, this was um, Joss Whedon's and John Cassidy's X-Men. And a couple of people got to play in that world. Greg Pak got to play with them with the Phoenix book, and you did. And the thing that kind of stands out for that book for me, not what we're here to talk about, but I'll throw it out anyway. You did the first Colossus Hulk fight ever. Ever? Yeah. Wow. Oh, I'm, I'm positive. He's a big <laughs> Colossus fan and a big Hulk fan, but... <laughs> Yeah, so that, that wow. was, I mean, that, that was a highlight for me. I'm like, yes, they finally, and they've done it a few times since, but yeah, that was the first go at it. Damn, I did not know that. And Colossus lost cool. terribly. Terribly. Yeah, well, you know, that was the, <laughs> the World War, the World War Hulk was like way powered up, so, you know, but he, he'd probably still lose anyway against the regular Hulk. Yeah, but, I don't uh, know. But no, that's always just a highlight for me, but, okay, so I was curious if that book had any connection to you getting the original Angel gig, but it doesn't sound like it. I don't think so. I, basically, as I understand, what happened is that Scott read a original graphic novel that uh, I did with the artist Chris Somney, who is, of course, you know, one of the major talents in the business, and this was one of his first big two books. It was for Vertigo. It was called Area 10, and it was a sort of a, you know, thriller noir with some supernatural elements to it, and Scott read it and liked it, and he thought I would be good for the Angel book, so he asked me if I was interested. In it. I read all, I watched all the shows. I said yes, and then we we had like a um, story summit out at Josh's house uh, in I want to say it was like January of 2011 thereabouts. I'm kind of curious how those worked because I mean you always see like I know that Marvel does them with most of their writers, but. The Buffy ones always struck me as interesting because they were like the most hyper specific writers summits that I've heard about. So I just I was curious how those all kind of came about and how they were. Well, the Marvel ones, at least the ones I've been to, are a little bit different because on those it's sort of like everyone gets together and then like you talk about what you're doing in your book. So, you know, I mean, in my day when I was writing Avengers Academy, I went out for the 
Avengers Summit. So like Bendis would say what he was doing in his books, and Matt Fraction would say what he was doing in his book, and Ed Brubaker would say what he was doing in Secret Avengers, and I'd say what I was doing in Avengers Academy, and then we'd try to figure out ways to, you know, coordinate and cool things we could do and maybe come up with an event or something. The Buffy summits were more like a TV writer's room where you've got a bunch of people all coming up with ideas for a single thing, or in the case of the Buffy comics, like two things or maybe two things it's a mini series or whatever it might be so you know there would be people there like at the first one jane espenson was there and let's see andrew chambliss who wrote the uh who wrote the buffy book at that point yeah when the season I nine stuff. Angel. i think uh, one of joss's brothers was there but i don't think he was i can't remember if he was like part of the whole thing or not it was a long time ago yeah and i've, I've gotten much older since then <laughs> uh, my, my memory's failing me but uh Anyway, it was it was really cool because that was more like everyone was throwing out different ideas. Like Jane had this really cool idea about you know because basically we were trying to figure out how do how do we bring if we if we do go there and we didn't make the decision to to bring Giles back to life until quite a ways into this the series the Angel and Faith series. But the uh, one of the questions was like if we do go there, how do we do it? Because obviously there's not resurrection is not something that happens easily in the in the Whedon verse. And Jane pointed out that, well, if his soul never left, uh, never went on to its final resting place because he had, it belonged to the, the demon. And I've forgotten. Was it Igon? Igon, Igon yeah. Uh, yeah, Igon. Because it belonged to the demon. I was like, oh, yeah, that's great. You know, because that, then you, if you can defeat the demon, you can get his soul back. And it's, it's not quite a resurrection. You're just putting it back into a body. So that was really cool. So, I mean, that, that's what it was like, and that's what a TV writer's room is like. So, for example, you know, you take a, a, any show, whether it be the, like Daredevil, for example, you're all sitting in a room, all the writers, and you're talking about different ideas for an episode, and you may not be, you're probably, you know, if you're one of the writers in the room, you're probably not writing that specific episode, but you're still coming up with ideas for it, and, and everyone's working together to figure out the story for it. So that's kind of what, so that the, I don't know what the Marvel Summits are like now. I haven't been to one in a while, but the Buffy ones were more like a TV writer's room. It just lasted for like one day. I completely forgot you did the Daredevil show too. Boy, yeah. <laughs> you do a ton of work. Yeah, So well, thanks for coming you know, out for this. And even Daredevil, that was a ton of people that were associated with the weed and stuff. Oh, yeah. Drew Goddard was our showrunner at first, and then when he left, Stephen Denight came in. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, we watched Daredevil. I took a day off from work, and we watched Daredevil, like, the whole season, the first season in one day. We called it Daredevil Day. We did. <laughs> That's awesome. And, yeah, um... Was- and I just remember watching the credits and Zach was like, yep, that was Whedon guy. Yep, Whedon, Whedon. Yep, 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 yeah. that was Whedon. <laughs> yeah. No, it was a good show. Very strong ties to the Whedon Academy, for, as, as it were. Yeah, it was, it was fun. I mean, I loved working with those guys. Drew, of course, is brilliant as is Steven. And, you know, it was, it was just a lot of fun. And we were all comic book people. So, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, Steven is now the showrunner on Jupiter's Legacy, which is a show yep. based on a comic book. And I was the one who introduced him to Jupiter's Legacy because I brought some into the office one day. And he's like, what is that? It looks really interesting. So I gave it to him because I was done reading it. And, you know, as I get older and run out of room for all my comics, I'm, I'm much more like it's like you come full circle back when you're to when you're a little kid and you read your comic and once you're done with it you give it to your friends you know because that, <laughs> so that's I, a mark millar book is it uh frank quietly was he the artist on that one yes it was frank quietly okay yeah. i thought so anyway so i gave, <laughs> just gave me a look i'm like this is my job i'm supposed to know this it's true it is your job but it is a fascinating amount of information up there you are the only guy who kind of got to cross over into both worlds between buffy and angel did you have a preference for uh which series you wrote Something that I've noticed since we've been doing this show is, I mean, obviously there's a lot of love for your Buffy stuff, but we get people kind of coming at us constantly that really loved your season on Angel. Well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I don't, for me, the funny thing is when we went into the story summit for season 10, I I wasn't sure if I was going to do Buffy or Angel because Andrew was leaving because uh, he was too busy with his TV work. I forget what show he was on at that time. I want to say it was the one with the fairy tale people. Oh, you know? Grimm? No, the other one. The one that uh, uh, Jane Espenson was on that I can't remember the name of. Yeah, Once Upon a Time. Oh, but, yeah. Yeah. Like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds right. Anyway, uh, you know, it was a network show, a lot of episodes, and he just didn't have the time. So um, I was told, well, do you want to do Buffy or Angel? And I was like, I think I want to stay with Angel. But then what we talked about doing with Buffy, I, I was really 
interested in and then i was like okay i want to do buffy by the end of it so how's it writing the two of them because i'm buffy is a character that is about growth and angel is a character that i always just say is a moth to the flame like he's a guy who's gonna you know he's gonna get through it but he's gonna stumble his way through and probably not learn that much by the end yeah 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 angel has has a bit of a uh you know i mean he's like a couple hundred years old and he hasn't learned a ton of lessons <laughs> I mean, he's learned some lessons but you know he hasn't changed all that much and that was actually one of the things we wanted to explore at one point which is like can a vampire and can an immortal change you know can they really change and you know because when you get right down to it the their initial relationship with buffy and angel it's like she was 16 and he was like 200 and that's kind of <laughs> creepy oh (laughs) yeah yeah. yes definitely you you couldn't do that anymore that just wouldn't fly yeah but it kind of works if you feel like well angel was 16 when he (laughs) i don't know how old he was when he got 28 turned and he didn't really progress as a individual you know what i mean until he got his well i can't even remember i think he got his soul back a long time ago so like yeah he's still creepy but anyway (laughs) (laughs) point being if if you think that an immortal doesn't change as much as a mortal then you know, it, it kind of works. It works a little better, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, when that came up in your run, that was in the Buffy season 10 stuff, you got to, for really the first time ever, deal with the, the love triangle head-on for the first time ever. Yeah. So what was that, yeah, that was, What was that like? It was fun. Uh, of course, I had the uh, expected shipper hatred coming towards me, <laughs> which... You know, is is part of the game and it doesn't bother me. But they have truly what? terrible names. I hate I hate that stuff. Like Bangle, Spuffy. They both sound yeah. so ugly. I know, and, and I don't even know how to. I, I was pronouncing it Bangel for a long time. You, you could. I don't know. It's just. No, they, no, no, it's it's bad either way. And I was Team Spander, uh, Sp- Spuffy. <laughs> uh, no, Spike and Xander uh, <laughs> should be together. Now, yeah, it, it's one dude called me pro rape for having Spike and, and Buffy together, and I was like, okay, you know. Mute. Yes, <laughs> but but it, so it was cool to to take it head on. Like obviously, the, um, you know, at the end of the day, when Buffy has her own book and Angel has his own book, they're not going to be together because the books would just be the exact same thing. But we did get to do a thing with with Spike and Buffy having a relationship now that he has a soul. And you know, the way I look at it, yes, what he did before he had a soul was horrible. So was Angel slaughtering churches full of nuns and before he had a soul. And if you kind of give him a pass on that, that's why you give Spike a pass for what he did before he had a soul. Having said that, I understand that there, uh, you know, people have said to me that they're bothered by the fact that, you know, Buffy as a character, you know, having a relationship with this dude who tried to attack her sexually and, you know, that it, in and of itself is disturbing. And I get that. I get that. That's one of those things that it can work in this universe where you can say something happened and they're a different person. It doesn't really work in right. real life. It's one of those, yeah, I, I, it's a weird yeah, balance. It, it, and, and, you know, there's there's certainly an argument to be made that because it doesn't work in real life, you shouldn't do it. But, you know, I don't know. That's not uh, the rules of this universe, like, uh, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, we did it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the good news is if, if you hated it, I'm not doing it anymore. Now, Jordy, <laughs> who I work with on Superior Spider-Man, she's our colorist on Superior Spider-Man, she's writing the Buffy book. So there you go. So you can direct your shipper hatred at her. <laughs> there you go, Jordy. Um, <laughs> no, she's terrific. And I, um, it's, it's, I, I, and I do dig, dig the fact that we have two Buffy comics writers on, on the same Marvel book. Yeah, I mean, boy, she's all over the place. Oh, yeah. She's another one who just, like, her name, she's all over coloring stuff in her book Redlands and Buffy. Yeah, she's doing a ton of work, too. Oh, I know. I know. Well, there you go. She's, you know, she's talented and people are figuring it out and, and you know, she's doing the same thing. She's just like, all right, I'm, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Her, no, I like her first two issues. They've been solid. I, I'll be honest. I haven't read them yet because I'm just so behind on everything. No, it's, oh. And old. <laughs> like, I listed off the credits of your card credits that I could think of off the top of my head and it was significant. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I remember when I was a kid and I just read every comic book that came out and now, now it's just not the same. I think I used to read more before I owned a store, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> time it's not always a you know the best thing yeah one of the things i was always curious about with buffy and you certainly dealt with it in the last season is how much um fray kind of hanging over everything affected the story well that's that was one of the things that we we wanted to deal with i mean it didn't really change things a lot in except in that you know it didn't it wasn't like oh well we can't do this because of fray or we we have to do this because of fray it was more like we were going to do what we were going to do but then when we we had the final story summit which was really just me me and joss we were essentially he was like you know what since Frey isn't going to go over to Boom Studios. Uh, it's gonna, it's a dark horse thing, and it's 
probably is never going to resurface again, you know, is like, let's deal with it. And I was like, yeah, that's totally cool. And it just seemed like a natural story idea to sort of get to that epic final battle that we saw alluded to in Frey and tell that story. So, you know, we had a very short number of issues to do it because the license was going to switch over at the end of the calendar year, so we needed enough time for all four issues to come out, plus the trade paperback. Um, so that's why it was as short as it was, but it, we, we decided to address it head on. And it was nice to end with a sort of a, a hopeful note in that Frey's future changed for the better, and she had a home in it. Uh, so, spoiler alert. <laughs> that's, that's, oh, no, we've already spoiled that for everybody. Don't worry. <laughs> a few times at this point. I'm, out of curiosity, speaking of that summit with Joss, I was reading an interview with him where he said you guys um, bandied around the idea of just killing everyone. <laughs> I think he... I think he took the, had that more as a. I think he took that more as a possibility than I did. I mean, obviously, <laughs> if he wanted to do it, I would have done it. But there was some talk. I'm like, yeah, should we just kill everybody? And you know, well. Yeah. That was Zach's big theory. So mine was like, there's got to be a happy ending. Like, nobody has to die. We'll just, everything will work out. And Zach was like, they're all going to die. Yeah, Everybody spent, will die. I spent a few months backing that idea. Not that I wanted yeah. it, but I'm like, they're going to die. Everyone's going to die. There's going to be consequences. So I appreciate the happy ending. Well, thank you. Well, we, so do it, I. It did come up. I am much more of a happy ending person than Josh is, I think, by nature, in, in terms of the stories we tell. But, uh, you know, we did sort of send Illyria to hell, but there was always the implication that she's going to come back because she's an immortal. Uh, yeah, she's well, an old one. Like, she's fine. Everybody's yeah. fine. I don't know if you meant to do it or not in the room, but I took that as such a gut punch for Angel. I'm like, boy, he lost another loved one through a portal, and Fred's back in a hell dimension. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the thing, uh, is, you know, it's not, it wasn't, it was sort of intended to be like, there was talk of being like, okay, should this be the end of the character's adventures at all? Like, should everyone be depowered? Should everyone be dead? And we just kind of at the end felt like, you know what, it should just feel like the end of a chapter and their, their adventures are going on somewhere that you could just sort of make up on your own if you want to. Like, I, I got all excited because I was like, now nah, I want to write a series about, you know, uh, Buffy and Angel as cops, like Charlie's Angels, but with Buffy and, and, and sorry, Buffy and, and Faith, you know, because they were in the police academy at the end of the story. So. I would love uh, everything about that. I really yeah. would totally love that. If you could in any way write that, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> I'll, I'll see what I can do. Yeah, no, I, I when I was a little kid, I, I watched Charlie's Angels. My first crush was uh, Kate Jackson <laughs> and Sabrina. So uh, that's where, you know, the inspiration for that came from. So you did mention this earlier, and I'll throw it in at the end, just because if there's anything I saw about season 12, keeping in mind, I liked what happened in season 12, but I did see some people upset about Buffy and Spike breaking up and kind of what the process was behind that. Yeah, so... I will say that even before they got together, my thinking was I wanted Buffy to grow as a person. So the idea was, one, to have her be in a relationship that is not without challenges, but ultimately a healthy, loving relationship, because so many of her relationships were fraught in some way. You know, with Angel, there was the whole losing his soul and betraying her. And then with uh, the other dude, I forget his name, Riley, you know, there was the whole thing about like he could, they couldn't be together because he was a normal person and this and that. And, you know, it's like, let's just do a healthy relationship. But even then, my plan was ultimately, I wanted Buffy to be on her own and cool with that because a woman does not always have to be with a man. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, like it, it, the idea that like, hey, you can be on your own and that's totally fine and you don't need, you know, it's obvious, it's often a trope of, of fiction, especially genre fiction that, you know, female characters are defined by their romantic partners and you know there's usually that's usually because things like love triangles make for great storylines and so forth but I, my idea was always to, to get to a point where Buffy's alone and single and happy about it and cool uh, with it and we did get there but it was faster and more abrupt than, yeah. than you know I thought it would be so that's why I think people were reacting to the fact that I mean there were some people who just wanted to be together forever and I get that but I think some people were reacting I mean, to the fact that, that it happened off work. screen as it were and it, it happened so abruptly and that was just a function of how much time we had to tell the story yes, we're going to end up working our way backwards I because <laughs> we're talking about season 12 okay. how, how did well it's, it's fine it doesn't really matter we can hop around yeah any, we're happy any, any we're happy to talk about form. anything so i imagine the season 12 news was a bit of a shock because at, at the time i think at the end of season 11 buffy was still like dark horse's fifth best-selling book so it was, st- so it was still it? okay it was still up there cool but, <laughs> but i imagine that's good to know <laughs> oh yeah definitely yeah no i mean it wasn't an entire shock because 
So at some point, Fox acquired Boom Studios or came into a co-partnership. I don't know. I'm not a business guy. I don't follow the business stuff. So we thought that at some point that there might come a time when they, they switched over the license when it when it ran out. So it wasn't like a total shock. But at the same time, I think the quickness of it did take us a little bit by surprise, like how soon it was going to happen. But, you know, it wasn't – I mean, to be honest, like I probably – I feel like it's probably about time that I stopped writing it and a woman started writing Buffy instead of me, <laughs> a middle-aged white guy. But, you know, I'm one of these people that, like, if you give me the opportunity, I will totally run something into the ground. I'm not going to quit while I'm ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay on long after I've passed my prime and, and you're going to get totally sick and tired of me. So uh, I'm not going to leave voluntarily. So it's nice that there was, this, there was this thing that happened that was like, okay, good. This is a good place to put in, write an ending to this chapter of my career and it was good but now we're moving on and uh, the characters moving on and the properties evolving and etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah i think i mean my read on it is i assume that was because of the disney fox acquisition of fox just kind of snatching up all their properties and putting everything kind of together for them that was yeah, my I mean, read i don't know if that's right or not I, I i guess so i mean you don't you know as much as i do but in the industry right now you know another thing that i don't know any more about than anyone else but you you see is the netflix Marvel shows being all being canceled. Obviously, some of them were quite popular, but I think I would guess that the thinking at Netflix is we would rather spend our resources on something that we own outright, and that's that's sort of the, the what's happening in the business. There's a lot more. I guess they call it vertical integration. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there was that was just the way things were moving. Now, having said that, you know, I've written some Incredibles comic books, which is a Disney property, and rather than have Marvel do the comics, they license that to Dark Horse. You know, because that, I guess they felt that was the best place. Marvel doesn't really do licensed, you know, comics for younger readers. I don't know what the thinking was, but, you know, it's not out of the realm of possibility. But it also wasn't a surprise when the Whedon first properties went over to Boom. Yeah, yeah I was, it was just one of those things. It was like, and there's four issues. I'm like, wow, that is, that was quick. <laughs> that was, yeah, it was, it was fast. I, we were so impressed with how much you managed to pack into those four issues and still have all the character beats and that was just very very impressive well thank you i mean i, I really have to praise uh, georges because he he fits so much in there like every time i was writing a page i'd be like oh this poor guy what am i doing this poor guy? <laughs> you know uh, well, the weird one for me is i think one of my it might be my favorite moment from that season is like Frey saying goodbye to gunther i'm like i didn't know i wanted that moment but damn if, <laughs> damned I if i wasn't emotional about it i know me too <laughs> Yes, that was a great yeah, movie. Yeah, talked about wanting to do that, so that, you know. Um, I guess speaking of George's, you, you had a number of great artists with you. I probably as, I associate you most with Rebecca Isaac stuff, but obviously uh, George's Genty was in there too. And I didn't know if you wanted to kind of speak on some of those collaborators you had. Oh, I mean, you know, I just felt totally, totally uh, spoiled as a writer because they're so good. You know, I mean, I, I remember uh, I actually met. Uh, Rebecca at San Diego Comic Con before all this happens because my friend Ben Abernathy who is now with DC but at the time was an editor at Wildstorm introduced me to her he's like hey this is a great talent coming up she's doing a DV8 book for us and she seemed real nice and her work was you know very uh, impressive I was like oh great to meet you you know and then like it wasn't that long afterwards that she came up in the conversation of you know possible artists and so I was thrilled when uh, she was hired to work on Angel and Faith because there's something about her work I mean she's so good with getting across the emotion just in the characters faces like as someone who writes both comics and screenwriting the toughest thing you know one of the things you can do in for the most part like comics you can do so much more you don't have to worry about the budget and all that but in screen in in live action when you've got actors actually you know talented actors performing the scripts you can be so much subtler because they can get across a lot in just a look or a gesture and expression and comics can't do that as much but a really talented artist can get across quite a bit so with uh, Rebecca and also Georges, but um, I, one of the things, you know, considering I hadn't seen much from Rebecca at that point, she was always so good at getting across how the characters were, were feeling through their, their faces, their body language, everything else. Uh, so it was just, and then the best part too for me is I was like, yeah, and this was a little bit sexist, uh, I guess, because I was like, oh, well, you know, of course she's going to be good with that. She's a girl, you know, but she's not going to be good at, at, at designing, like, really creepy, awful, horrible monsters. Oh, my God, she was just so good at it. She designed the best monsters ever, and it got to the point where I would just stop giving 
really detailed instructions and be like, you know, let's, give, let's do something that like has tentacles and an exposed brain and just go nuts. And she'd just come up with something and I'd be like, oh my God, that's so much better than anything I could ever have imagined. So her creature designs are so good. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I just felt, you know, utterly, utterly spoiled with, with uh, Rebecca and we had a great, great working relationship and, and, you know, my wife adores her too uh, and, and she and her husband are really good people. So uh, we're not working together anymore, but we're still in touch and, you know, I, I just, uh, all the success she's had and hopefully will continue to have is well deserved and of course George's I knew from before from you know the season 8 stuff and, and he was always terrific and getting to work with him was so good because you know he's got a similar facility for getting across emotion and character acting uh, and the thing with him is he doesn't seem to mind He's like George Perez or Phil Jimenez. Yeah. Like he doesn't mind really packed pages. <laughs> so especially in season twelve, that was that was convenient <laughs> because we had some really packed pages. Uh, but now he was he's great because he'll throw in these little sight gags and stuff in the background with different monsters. And uh, you know he's always always thinking, always yeah. thinking about telling what's best for the story. And and he just he leaves it all in the field, as they say. I, I wasn't even thinking about it when we started this, but yeah, we're um, there's a couple of Rebecca Isaacs page the, from your run up in the room where we are. We can't fully see it because we're surrounded by recording foam, but no, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, and, and actually, there's a few up in the store too. Yeah, we have we have a fair number of comic pages from you guys, so thanks. Oh, that's great! So you've got the original art. Yeah, yeah I don't. That's awesome. To be yeah, honest, at, at some point she switched over to digital, uh, so um, you know you guys are lucky to have that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. That's, that's why there's no season eleven stuff up on that art page. Then, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> it stops at season ten. There we go. That's why <laughs> I've solved my own mystery. There you go. <laughs> my work here is done. Oh, perfect. Yeah, well, I mean, to be fair, the stuff we have down here, of course, there's some pretty grotesque stuff. <laughs> Just fight scenes. But I mean, it's gorgeous. Like oh, it's yeah, beautifully it done. But yes, a little grotesque. <laughs> I guess kind of jumping back to Angel, what was the thought behind just having it be like an Angel and Faith book versus like, well, let's get like everyone back in together that was there before. I, I agree that Faith should be a titular character because you know she deserves it. Well, it, that was Josh's idea. I mean, it was already decided upon even before I came along. So uh, I, I'm not sure what his thinking behind it was, other than he loves the characters. But I loved it because one of the one of the things that a lot of people tell me that they really like about that series, especially coming from women readers, is they say, you know, I just really like the fact that you had a straight man and a straight woman and they were partners and there was no yeah. romance between them. Yeah, yeah never. The, the it was great. Were, it's, it's what it should have been. I mean, that yeah. should have been part of that. So, yeah, that worked really and, well. And, and we didn't decide, like, th that That was an open question. Well, should there be romance? Should there be, you know, should they hook up? Should they, you know, should there be some question of will they or won't they? And ultimately, we just decided not to because we it, it, it seemed kind of forced. And I think that really resonated with a lot of people, both for that reason and also because it's like, hey, a man and a woman can be friends uh, and care deeply about each other and be partners and fight side by side and they don't have to you know be romantically involved with each other and you see that every day in real life you don't see it often in fiction so i think a lot of people were responding positively to that so you know i think it worked out nicely and we got to do some cool stuff like uh introducing faith's father oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes the boston accent yeah because <laughs> we're up um, in maine from massachusetts so i, I know oh where. okay that explains so much yeah of my voice. <laughs> that explains everything I was we're so up curious. in maine so we were very familiar with it as well uh yeah i don't have one but i i grew up there so because uh, i also lived when i was a kid i lived in greece for a few years and then i was actually born in new york so I never quite acquired that the Boston at the, the thick Boston accent. Sometimes you can hear it a little bit. I mean, that's probably for, it's an ugly, ugly accent. Yeah, well, I, I <laughs> we like can say it, that we're is, from the area. It is, yeah, no, it, it's very pronounced. Um, it is. It's, no, I, it's I, distinctive. I, 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 I mean, we, you know, when we wrap up tonight, we're going to go watch the Celtics. So we still have some Boston <laughs> love. Nice. I mean, not they're they're losing terribly. It's not great. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> oh well. But you know, beyond that. I, I, I watched the Celtics in the 80s when the Larry Bird era, but then I've just kind of fallen out of it, and I'm more into the Patriots and Red Sox nowadays. I mean, don't bother coming back this season. Maybe next year. Well, spring, okay. spring <laughs> training unrelated, started unrelated. yesterday, didn't it? I think spring, tra spring training for baseball started yesterday, right? I think so, yeah. So the I Sox are back. To to one of the World Series games out here in L.A. Oh, no kidding. That's so yeah. cool. So more on kind of the Angel stuff. What, what was it like defining yeah. Whistler? Because, I mean, he had been in two episodes ever, and then he kind of popped yeah, up well, in that, season that, eight as a big role, like behind the scenes. That's 
sort of came out of Joss putting him in season eight as this, like there's a scene where he's advising Angel or something. And yep. I found that very uh, interesting because like, you know, if he was advising Angel, I mean, it was kind of a bad idea what he was telling him <laughs> to do. But, you know, so I started thinking about it and trying to figure it out. And I was like, I said to Joss, would you object to like making Whistler the big bad of the season? And he was into it. So uh, that's what we ended up doing. And, and I, I, you know, wanted to explore the idea of a magical being almost being less like essentially the uh, the superpower that ordinary humans have, I guess, is free will and that to an extent the magical beings have less of it. I mean, you see that with the vampires. They can't help but be evil. Even when Spike didn't, have, when Spike didn't have a soul, even when he was trying to be a good guy, he couldn't help but do evil shit and be evil because that's ultimately, you know, he lacked the soul. So I, I, I was thinking like, what does the soul give you? Well, I guess it gives you this this sort of free will, the choice to be a good person or whatever, to grow as a person. Uh, so anyway, that was all sort of wrapped up in there. And the idea being that when magic ended, that, you know, it kind of drove him crazy. And I can't remember all of the details now, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> that season, something that I liked, and it always seemed to be kind of a struggle of the books, is introducing new characters. Mm-hmm. Something I really liked about Angel is, I mean, both doing like the Pearl and Nash character, but the ones that really stood out to me were the aunts. It's kind of like oh, the, yeah, the breakout some... new character. Oh, yeah, we loved the aunts. We well, still do. I, I had so much fun writing them. I really enjoy writing characters who are kind of self-centered, like Harmony, um, <laughs> who's one of my favorites to write, and uh, Superior Spider-Man, actually. Uh, so yeah. that was a lot of fun. And the interesting thing about that is that was a recycled idea from the proposed Ripper TV series that was Josh was going to do with the BBC at one point, which would have told the story of... I can't remember if it was a young Giles or a current day Giles. Anyway, the aunts were going to be characters in it and they were going to be played by Anthony Stewart Head's actual daughters. So the look of the aunts is based on his daughters. Uh, they're actually, they resemble them for that reason. So Josh was like, yeah, this is, this is, there's this idea I had for, uh, and he had their names and everything. You know, he said this idea I had for, for Ripper that we never got to use, so use it in here. So that was really cool. Well, it's awesome. I think it's definitely one of the parts that works the most out of the whole thing. Yeah, they were definitely, I think, my favorite new characters to get introduced. Well, thank you. That was, it was just a lot of, a lot of fun to write. Um, I'm running out of Angel ones, but I am curious about uh, kind of what the thought was behind moving on, um, moving the book beyond the IDW stuff, because you're the only person who ever brought up even any references to it at all. Well, the IDW stuff, I mean, I read it. The whole After the Fall thing was, I enjoyed it. You know, it was based on the, Joss's ideas for what he would have done within the sixth season of Angel. So I felt that it, there should be some, you know, it was a tough line to walk, because on the one hand, like, you want those stories to be valid for the people who read them and liked them. On the other hand, you want the book to be new reader friendly. So we kind yeah. of took the approach of like, you know, when Angel came back in season eight, a lot of those, it was like fixing, changing the timeline as it were. So a lot of those things, you know, didn't affect the outside world. So it was kind of like trying to have your cake and eat it too, as it were. I, no, I, really, I appreciated that. the references that were in there because, yeah, it was like, well, once it switches over, is it going to get, you know, totally ignored? But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I have friends at IDW, I, you know, and I didn't want to, certainly didn't want to slight, I mean, I've worked there, I, I co-wrote the ROM series with Chris Ryle. Uh, oh yeah, we've had uh, him on um the show before. Yeah, Chris is a good guy. Yeah, he was lovely. We, went, we actually went to see Morrissey together at the Hollywood Bowl. With Billy <laughs> <Idol>. <laughs> um, so I guess kind of moving on from the Angels, because I think that's all I have, my, my Angel-related questions. <laughs> all right. Buffy season 11, I as far as I'm concerned, that was kind of the peak of all the dark horse books and it's a massive tonal change it doesn't it still fits within the world but that's the season where like you seem to like buckle down and say okay we're gonna tackle some real stuff in this i'm just curious what the thought process was behind dealing all of that because it's very real and very of today well thank you because a lot of times i feel like i am not very of today <laughs> well, like i'm stuck in the 80s or you know the when 90s when i was when I was still young and uh, not dead inside yet, but no, I, I mean it was it was really it was a lot like you say. It's like okay, let's do some real shit here. You know, if if we're going, let's really talk about what it is like to be a person. You know, trying to survive in the world and especially with the relationship with with Spike, we wanted to not shy away from the fact. That it's like okay, maybe you know, for example. If you're going to say that Spike gets a pass for what he did before he had a soul, it's fine to say that, 
but he looks exactly like the dude who tried to attack you when you were taking a shower. So that's why we had that scene where like they're in their relationship and they're happy together, but Buffy's in the shower and he comes in like looking for a toothbrush or something and she flips out and kicks him across the yeah. room because it's like, you know, PTSD from what happened and that forces them to confront, you know, confront it head on, which is a healthy thing to do and, and it's good that they did it. So yeah, it was, it was kind of like that. It was like, okay, let's, you know, let's deal with some shit. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I remember when the like first issue of season eleven came out, and they're like, "Oh, we're gonna have registration of mystical beings." It was like the day before the news. It's like maybe registration and like internment camps are coming back. I'm like, my god, this couldn't be any more timely and terrible. That was so funny because uh, people were like, "Did you know what was gonna?" I was like, "No, I didn't know." What was gonna <laughs> How would I know that? <laughs> <laughs> like at that point, I'm just gonna play the lottery if I can guess this stuff. Exactly. Exactly. And it's funny because, you know, obviously the whole registration plot line is something that we've seen, you've seen in the X-Men going back. I mean, one of the first X-Men comics I ever read was Days of Future Past, so there was some yep. degree of influence there. And, of course, ever, Joss's show, the shows were influenced by Chris Claremont and his collaborators' X-Men stories. So yeah, because Buffy's kidding. Apropos. Yeah, it, it felt apropos. Um, and there was some degree of, like, I remember when Joss and I were talking about before that season, he said, you know, he said, um, seemed like the world was on a good place and, and moving forward and, and, you know, towards a good future. And it's like, and then I had kids and all of a sudden everything started going to shit. <laughs> you know? and, and he's like, I don't know if it's because I had kids and now I'm like, oh shit, what are they, world are they going to grow up in? Or if it's just, you know, the like circle of life or whatever it is. But uh, he, he was like, let's deal with some of this stuff. So yeah, we were, we were addressing some of the things that were in the zeitgeist, like intolerance of, of the other and, <laughs> you know, fear and everything else. Yeah, gosh, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just got such a look. Yeah, I'm being just a hair coy, but not that much. <laughs> yeah. Well, I also remember because you get we get everything in the store just the day before it goes out on the shelves. And so Zach read it and I came to pick up the dog at the store and he was like, you have to see this. You have to see how close this is to real life. It's scary. <laughs> and I was like, oh, great. Thanks. <laughs> It is kind of weird how that all played out. Was because I know within the seasons when it was on television, there was talk about like this is our theme for the year. Was there uh, talk about that when you guys were planning seasons out comics wise? Because I mean that's a bit of a different beast than most books, which are like you know minis or ongoings. But the season format is kind of unique. Yeah, I mean there was some degree of that because the issue count, especially for I think season eleven, was I can't remember if it was thirty issues or what, but it was a lot. So. I don't think it was specifically, this is going to be the theme, the theme for every single issue, but there was a general feeling we wanted to go for, which is sort of like, you know, there was high school, then there was Buffy in college, and then there's like post-college, and then this is sort of like becoming an adult, you know, when you're, when you're entering the adult world and everything is on you, and whether your life, you know, works out or doesn't, and the people you love around you, whether things go well or not for them, it's all on you. Like, you can't turn to mommy and daddy and be like, fix this for me. And that's one of the reasons there was, a, a, I think that was, there was a point in that season when Buffy's dad sort of says, hey, I'm getting remarried and I have, you know, and she has kids and, you know, they're young and uh, you're not invited to the wedding because we're afraid some demons are going to attack. Yeah, that was, that was <laughs> harsh. <laughs> that was harsh. Uh, what a crap dad. It was dad. pretty cold-blooded, you know, but that, that was sort of like to underscore the idea of like, you know what, you're on your own. You are literally on your own and you've got to make your own decisions. And, and that's, I mean, it's still... Uh, I still feel that way now, but especially when you're young, like when you're in your you know mid late twenties and you're going out there, you feel like you're, you're you're having to make these decisions that like especially now that are going to determine like the rest of your life. So it, it's really scary, <laughs> and you know that that was sort of the theme. I mean, as it were, as close as you can get to a a, 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 theme, a single theme. Uh, this is a random one, and I don't know if you you'll have the answer to it. Do you know what the because uh, it's been popping up a lot for whatever reason in the last couple of months on social media with artists? Do you know what happened with the Drusilla series that didn't happen? I do not. I actually uh, reference it in the book in Angel of Faith. I think. Uh, yeah, the book was, I was writing. It was something that worked out, but then something happened later with the two of them. So yeah, I mean, it all worked out fine. I think that yeah, I don't know. I know there was plans of doing it, and then there was some sort of scheduling thing. And I don't even know. I mean, you'd have to ask the, the principals involved in that because I, I don't know the details. Yeah, we saw um, for whatever reason the last couple of months, like artists have been posting stuff like here's a cover or here's some like work that was done on this book that didn't happen for whatever reason. It's been popping up recently. Yeah. No, I, I read the sort of 
the plot summary that uh, Juliet Landau wrote up, and it was good. It was quite good. Uh, I mean, I can only vaguely recall. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was <laughs> yeah, a while ago. It was a long time ago. Yeah. It's just one of those things that's been popping up for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, partially because of the house we live in, and also seeing kind of your social media stuff. I imagine including cats was just something that you wanted to do for bringing everyone yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, because I'm a cat person, and yeah, and and actually Megan Levins, who was our pinch hitter uh, artist when uh, Rebecca needed a break, she was really terrific, and she's uh, she has a cat and a dog, and so she liked that too, and it was just it was just a fun thing that people responded to. Oh wait, no, no, I absolutely loved it. I loved that that Xander and Spike shared cats together. <laughs> that was so yeah. precious. That was literally like highlight of that season. Not gonna lie. <laughs> Really was, enjoyed the cats. Fun. That's true. Every time there's an animal, that is the highlight for you. Yeah. Of anything. Yep. Well, <laughs> yeah, and just the fact that Clem eats cats is also hilarious, but in the other way. <laughs> terrible. And terrible. Yeah. So I love that Spike saved them. So thanks. Yeah. I don't know where our cat... Is he around the other side? I don't know where he is. We have a cat lurking somewhere. Yeah, we lost uh, him. Yeah. <laughs> I've got three, but I think they're all sleeping. We have a dog in between us. He's asleep. <laughs> Yeah, they like to do that. Just because you did do it for so long, did you have um, any favorite characters to write? My favorites to write were uh, the Ants and <laughs> Harmony and Clem. I always had so much fun with them. And Harmony and Clem's super dysfunctional relationship and Harmony just being so selfish and, and having no filter whatsoever. That's why like, she was the character in season 12 who survived into the future and recapped everything that happened in the past because i just love writing her when she yeah, popped up i was the, just like of course of it was co- so of perfect course she yeah survived <laughs> of course she did and, and one of the one of the most fun moments for me was in like season 11 when she gets a hold of, of the i guess it was season 11 or maybe it was season 10 i can't remember 10 season 10 where she gets a hold of the magic book and she's she can write anything she wants in it and she and it'll happen and so she's dictating to clem what she what what should happen yeah. in it and she talks about how you know she's throwing a bone to buffy and company and she's like so buffy and angela spike finally realize they need to live together in a polyamorous relationship yeah. and it was so much fun <laughs> seeing rebecca draw that panel of like the three of them together and like i can't remember exactly how it is but it's like Angel is massaging Buffy's feet and Spike is pouring honey like, or something like that. Honey on his, on his back. <laughs> it, it was just so funny uh, and enjoyable. Uh, it was delightful. And then um, and then unicorns make it in the world from that, right? It's yes. the, that's the unicorn one. <laughs> that's the one thing that, that Clem, uh, Clem did write in the book, that unicorns are real now. Actually, I really like, because that was a relationship that you kind of did whole cloth because they never interacted. Well, it, it worked. did a I thing where it. they were they had a reality show. This was for some yeah. of the season eight ancillary material. So that's where I got that from. So I can't take credit for it, but it, I just certainly jumped on and, and rode with it because it was so much fun. Another one that I picked up on from season eight is that Drew uh, Goddard wrote this relationship between Dracula and Xander <laughs> yep. uh, where they, you know, they have this sort of bromance and he just, loved the fact that I picked it up and kept going with it because it was so much fun and he said he said oh yeah I remember when I wrote those issues he's like of course initially the scene where Dracula is talking with his little servant Butterworth he's like that went on for like eight pages and Josh's <laughs> like yeah you gotta you gotta dial it back a little bit because <laughs> it was so much fun to write and there was so much Buffy comics talk too because all those guys worked on season eight and so Stephen uh tonight in Daredevil uh when we were doing Daredevil he would occasionally, there was this joke that, like, there was this character, Madame Gow, and we knew she was supernatural to some degree, and you, but we never settled on quite how, and, and Stephen was like, so, and then Daredevil hits her, and she dissolves into a thousand rats, and they all run off, going, flee, my brothers, we are discovered. And then he was like, <laughs> where does that come from, flee, my brothers? And then one day he was like, shit, it's Vampy Cat, it was <laughs> yep. from season eight. Uh, flee, my brothers, we are discovered. So, yeah, there was a lot of, there was a lot of Buffy comic talk. Yeah, I mean, he was always a guy that his writing was always, he always had the best action episodes. It was always the yeah. stuff I associated him with. Like, if there, well, was a, Josh, if there was a big fight, it was his episode. Yeah. Well, Josh told me, um, I think he might have been the one, because so, I can't remember who it was. Someone talked, one of them talked about how they were doing the episode of Angel, I think it was Steven, where, where Buffy and, 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 and uh, I'm sorry, Angel and, and uh, Faith fought on a rooftop in the rain. Yeah, I don't uh, remember and, whose that was off the top of my head. And that it was written as being in the rain, and somebody was like, you know this is Southern California, right? And it never rains. And they were like, well, we don't have to do it in the rain, but it actually rained, so they, they did shoot it in the rain. So that was kind of cool. That's going to bug me. I can't remember whose episode that was off the top of my head. 
Joff told me that Stephen wrote a spec Buffy that got him to, uh, hired on the show, and in it, it was about how Xander gets Slayer powers, and but he goes mad, he can't handle it, he starts to go crazy, and they have to figure out a way to take them away from him, so Joss was impressed, because, like, so he broke, like, one of the key rules of the show, but then explained, in doing so, explained why it's a rule, and he was really impressed by that, and so I, I referenced that. I was going to get that sounds familiar yeah. to the end of season 12. Sounds eerily <laughs> yeah, so similar. In season 12, when uh, Hearth gets the Slayer the entire, the full Slayer power and goes crazy because he can't handle it. Oh. So there you go. Just because it's all over and, you know, this universe is kind of done now, it will count this as absolute canon. Wiki articles for years to come will reference this. Uh, all if, right, then. If anyone were to get the Shanshu, who would it be? My answer uh, is I don't think either one of them deserve it, but that's You know what? I am, I am really team uh, Spuffle, which is... <laughs> all three of them together i think they just need to I, I think they just need to embrace it they just need to embrace the polyamory there we go they and both become human and all get together why exactly. not exactly i think that sounds great and sounds good that's canon now yep that is the it's future canon. of this series it's canon also i really enjoyed that it's not a couple name whatever you want to call it that relationship <laughs> name that sounds great yes angel and I spike are my up. favorite couple Sorry? Angel and Spike were always my favorite couple. Yeah. Just that, there you go. I mean, <laughs> they show up, they bicker. I enjoy it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they are like an old married couple. Is there anything that you wanted to do with these characters that you didn't get the chance to do? Not really. I would have liked for season 12 to have been longer if possible. You know, I, I, I'm not like mad or anything that it wasn't. I, I understand why. But no, really, I got to do everything I wanted to do. Uh, I would have just liked to have had a little more space and time to... You know, to tell that story, obviously. I mean, I'm mostly annoyed that that means the library editions can't get printed anymore. I know. They're really they're really nice, aren't they? They were big and they were cheap. I mean, it was a good combo. Yes. <laughs> that is always a great combo. Uh, can't complain about it. Boy. But, yeah, no, there's nothing that I was like, boy, I wish I could have done that and never did. You know, if I came up with an idea, I pretty much put it on the on the page because God knows there aren't a lot of good ideas floating around, you know, that you can spare them. So. <laughs> Boy, after, I mean, that's one you had an insanely long career on this, but I think I've asked all the questions I have about it. I know. Also, oh, by the way, random thing. Thanks for answering whatever dumb question I tweeted you about this stuff while it was all happening. I appreciate oh, that. Yeah. Whatever, Especially. Whatever dumb thought crossed my mind, I'm like, I wonder about this. I have no memory of what my answer might have been, but I'm glad I wasn't rude. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm, I think they're all recorded in podcast form. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> sometimes, somewhere. sometimes you would get a tweet during oh, our podcast about... recording, and you'd tweet right back, and it was so kind, so thank you. <laughs> I forgot about that, because usually like, if our phone goes off, I'll cut it, but it was like, the phone went off, I was like, oh, that's an answer to a question I asked like an hour ago, now we can put it in the podcast. <laughs> well, there you go. Thank God. Yeah, I mean, I, I love these books. It was because, I mean, I loved the story when it was on the air and getting it continued in this format was insane. I mean, what kind of, you know, I mean, second life that it had for years and years and years. Yeah. I it, know. It, it, and you carried that. That's nuts. Well, it was it was it was fun. I mean, I, I'm glad I got a chance to do it. I think I did it for seven years. It's funny because at one point this was pre, well, I can't remember if it was, it was, I think it was pre season 12. We were talking and Josh was like, well, you've been doing it now longer than I did. And I was like, no, I haven't. He's like, oh, wait a second, seven seasons, seven years? Yeah, maybe I have. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I obviously haven't been doing it longer because he was involved with season eight yeah. and all that. But it it kind of hit me like how long I've been involved with it. And yeah, it I was, mean, it lasted longer it, as a comic than it did as a show. Yeah, and oh, yeah. so it was it was kind of wild, and it's I'm, I feel privileged to have been part of it, you know. And the fandom has been just terrific. I mean, I, I go to conventions, and my favorite thing is when people come up with their kids, and you know, the parents will say. I was watching this show when I was in high school or even younger or whatever, and, and now we watch it together, me and my kid watch it together, and then we read the comics, and it's really nice. I mean, it really warms your heart to see that, that it just it's, continues to inspire people. Yeah. I mean, and we, you know, boy, I don't even know how long we've talked about it here. Just uh, just your stuff alone, I don't know, 40, 50 hours of just dedicated <laughs> podcast time. Yeah, for uh, sure. Surely you could have found oh. something better to talk about than that. <laughs> <laughs> But it was always so clear how much you loved it, like how much love you put into it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm glad that it comes across. I mean, one of the things I learned very early in film school was that you have to love what you're writing because if you don't love it, no one else is even going to like it. Uh, so <laughs> that's why there is no, there, you know, it, it's just generally a bad
that idea to take a, a job for some other reason than that you love it you know like you think it's a cool gig you know like you you want to you want that if you take a job because you want the paychecks any kind of creative job you're just gonna it's it's gonna work out badly <laughs> you know so i try to just take jobs that i'm i'm excited about and i'm glad it comes through I mean, like we've said a couple of times, you've written a ton of stuff, but I, I don't know what the thing in your career is going to be that people like always look back on, but I promise this is something that's always going to stand out for years and years to come. Well, I appreciate that. I, I, would, I would be happy if people remembered anything. I, you know, I always feel like my obituary would be like, you know, journeyman writer Christos Gage died today of cirrhosis of the liver. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just a laundry list of stuff. But I mean, I don't know. I'm, I, I sort of, I, I, I view myself in the same category as a lot of those um, comic book creators from like the Golden Age and Silver Age who, you know, they loved what they were doing, they found it artistic, but they also took it seriously as a job and, you know, just got picked up their lunch pail every day and went to work and did the best they could, and that's what I try to do, so if people end up liking it, then hey, that's that's just gravy in my opinion. <laughs> Boy, you, thank you <laughs> do you have any other questions it's always because i've been like you know ruminating on this stuff for like you've been doing it since like 2011 i've been thinking about this for like eight years i'm like and i think i'm out <laughs> for I now know. i think my questions would, have been answered i am here to uh, to answer all the questions and put your mind at ease yeah i think i think that's it yeah wow weird what a weird what a weird cap on everything but what I mean, a great I mean, cap I, on everything. I, I like it too, but it's always weird because, you know, I think for this show, I feel like we've had like 18 different caps. I'm like, and that's the end. And it's like, and that's the end again for now. Um, well, no, thank you very much for giving us uh, your time and answering and all for these ridiculous questions. Seven years <laughs> no, no, of writing. <laughs> yeah. My pleasure. No, we, I mean, we have it all in the house, like up in my store, up in our home. We have art from your work up. Like it's, it's really loved. Well, thank you very much. I really, I really do appreciate that. It makes me happy. And of course, thank you for coming on. It was nice, kind of getting to do it like once everything wrapped up. Yeah, we can yeah talk totally. about it as a whole. Yeah, for I know sure. I, I, there have been past times when I was too busy, and I'm glad that we sort of found a, a moment where it worked out. Well, no, me really, too. It was also the last time I was going to ask. I'm like, I don't want to pester. I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm, I'm glad this is the one you responded to. Oh, good. Good. I, I don't want to be that guy. That that guy's awful. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks. Well, thanks for thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. No. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Take care. So thanks so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys. Take yeah. care. Thank Bye. you. Have a good night. Well, that's a thing we just did. Oh, I didn't know we were still talking. We, we got a plug. Oh, we, yeah. We got a Patreon. I forgot about that. We got a social media. So, again. <laughs> we, we have forgotten that in the past in interviews, we've had to like come back later. Like, we forgot to do the end stuff. Um, we're remembering this time. Thanks for the millionth time to Christos Gage for such an awesome interview. What a... I don't... Yeah. I, I kind of got cool everything thing. I wanted out of that. It's, it's weird. It's so weird. Because like every time we put a cap on the show, it's always like, and that's it. Well, and it's so funny too. Like I feel like we should have tweeted people and been like, "What questions do you guys have?" Yeah, I'm happy knowing what I wanted to know. <laughs> so we hope that we answered your questions too. And if not, he's a really lovely guy. So that's really. So he's friendly say. on Twitter to me. So. Um, and an interview form. So thanks to our listeners for listening too. We hope that you guys enjoyed that. Yeah, next time uh, we'll be back to do. Uh, coverage of the very first Firefly arc. I think that's it. Yeah. If you want to get the show a week early every time we put it out, patreon.com slash editors note comics. We also have non spoiler and spoiler reviews of Buffy and Firefly that come out there exclusively on Patreon. And I have another show that comes out a day early on that format. If you want to reach out to us, you can find everything at editors note comics.com. We're also having a really big sale at the store if you happen to be in Maine. That's done by the time this comes out. We had a really big sale at the store. <laughs> Sorry that you missed it. Come visit it anyway. We're still in Maine. I mean, yeah, give to our Patreon. We're also going to be at the Bangor Comic Con coming up. If uh, anybody yeah. is further into Maine. <laughs> Just further north. <laughs> but well, anybody want to stop by and say hi? And, and then in September, we're going to be in New Hampshire. So At Granite State Comic Con with uh, Buffy artist George Genty. Yeah, so come say hi to... George's and I guess stop by our table just because we're also going to be there. <laughs> like you're minorly tangentially connected with this, I guess. Yeah, but it's a great show, so go to that one too. Uh, we'll be back, I guess, next week for Firefly. Talk to you guys later. Days. I don't know. Sometime, sometime soon. Okay. Well, anyway, bye. Bye.